Wait, he's... Hey, Matt. Hello, Brian. Here we are again, and this time we're joined by Jason DeHart. Hello to you both. Hey, hey. Hello, Jason. So tell us about yourself, Jason. Who are you and what do you do? Absolutely. I am an educator. Let's see. I've spent time as a literacy professor. I've done that. Uh, currently high school English teacher, and I study, read, write, uh, explore comics, explore creating, and, and share. Generally, literacy research is kind of where I live. Okay, awesome. And um, can you tell us just a little bit about uh, your book that's coming out? Where, where you oh, sure. At? Sure. Um, so I do have a book about graphic novels that's coming out in about two months uh, that focuses on critical literacy. But I think the book that you're mentioning is currently at the proposal stage. Okay. Um, and it, it's looking, it's an edited volume, and it looks at AI and particularly AI in the classroom. And it's, it's currently out for uh, sort of peer review and things like that. So I can't say too much about it, but I can certainly talk about some of the ideas, some of the things that I hope to bring in a chapter there, and uh, anything generally related. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Matt has a little experience with graphic novels himself. Just a little. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm going to, I have just a couple things I wanted to share. Um, and then we can, we can chat about stuff. Um, I have, uh, they posted a few more um, things uh, done by uh, Sora, which is the AI video generation. I, I, Jason, have you heard of that or, or seen what that is? I, I have heard of it. Um, I have honestly not played with that particular tool. Okay, cool. Um, so it is a text-to-video tool um, put out by OpenAI, and um, here's some examples uh, that they've that they've done with it. Um, I'm just gonna just play a few. <laughs> There's that one. Kind of interesting. So that one, they, they typed in a computer hacker Labrador retriever wearing a black hooded sweatshirt sitting in front of the computer with a glare of the screen emanating on the dog's face as he types very quickly. What I like about that one is the prompt was a low quality, visually disappointing Super Bowl commercial. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Pretty, pretty accurate. Um, yeah. So, oh. <laughs> um, yeah. Any any thoughts on those? Or I go to the other, the other. Um, pretty... So essentially, the thing is, you type in a description of something, and Sora generates a video two-dimensional model of what that might look like. Yeah, it's basically generating, like like image generation, it's just doing it with video. Um, the um, the increase in quality just over the last month has been insane. If you looked at what this was doing a month ago, it was not at even close to this level, and it was limited to four seconds. 
and now they're they're doing it at 60 and then you can tell it to continue on from the end point so it can just kind of keep going um, I just I, I don't know the uh, direct relevance of this but um, some some of the samples they've shown are of animation as well uh, and I know that there have been some uh, fairly large layoffs at some animation studios subsequent to the release of this and uh, oh, wow. that there are animation studios that are looking looking at this and animators that are rather nervous about the whole thing so brian were these uh, layoffs do you were they mentioned in conjunction with sora they they just happened to have happened a week after it was released so the coincidence you, sure uh -huh. could be could be yeah um yeah so this is uh again this is available now in other words can you put prompts into sora now and okay the interesting thing is they've released it to some a, a initial group of content creators to kind of bang away at it some they have not released it to the public yet. One of the reasons they said they haven't is because they are they're they are not quite sure about the how people are going to use it. <laughs> um, I I kind of the the vibe that I'm getting is that they, this has actually been at this level for a little bit, and that they haven't released it, but that since uh, competitors have been releasing more and more video stuff. They felt like they had to show that yes, they're actually still ahead of the curve. Um, that's the thing is we don't you don't actually know how advanced any of this stuff really is. Just what they're choosing to show at any any moment. Um, so yeah, I mean I can't see any way that it could be misused. Can you guys? No, no, of course not. I was just thinking, how many prompts could I put in there to kind of show like who I went to the prom with? I mean, yeah, great, yeah, great in that way. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, you know what? There's uh, do you? I don't know if you remember, um, Matt, when we uh, we sh we were looking at Dolly and we we showed an example where it had made a little a king potato with his little minions um but uh let me share my screen while my dog it's weird i don't remember that or um that's baby i'm sorry that's that email please please work that's good um okay hold on brian yeah. um did we create these this potato king no this was one of the, of the potato king examples that they had shown okay we yeah. just we, it was just a it was just a still synchronistic uh, thing that we made potato potato king too yeah yeah yep maybe they uh, stole it from us brian uh, you know they don't steal stuff matt they wouldn't do that you know <laughs> you know as well as i do that they do not take other people's content and use it in any way um so that's sora yeah so that's sora sora continuing to kind of blow people away um and then the other thing I wanted to just uh, mention um, was uh, there's there's this thing called Hicks, and um, I can I can just show you what the interface looks like, uh, but it's more just I want to describe. So Hicks, uh, it's called Hicks Bypass. So there are a bunch of services out there for uh, writing. Uh, that will you can like say you're a teacher and you get something you think a student has written using chat GPT or any other AI system it will okay. anal there's a bunch of different uh, services that use their AI to analyze the generated AI to tell whether or not it's AI 
And so this is another AI that takes the AI written by, say, ChatGPT or Claude or whatever, and then it rewrites it so that the other AIs won't know that it's written by AI. So the AI <laughs> is adjusting, so the writing it so the other AI can't detect it. And on top of that, it then takes what it's rewritten and submits it to all the other AI detectors. And if they do detect that it's still written by AI, it will continue to rewrite it until it passes as human, and then it will give it to you. So, um, yeah. That, I'm just, I've always oh, started the cat and mouse game uh, trying to detect this stuff, and this is like, yeah. And the fact that it can, it'll just automatically send it off to the services means that every time they update, it's automatically going to adjust itself until it passes whatever, whatever it's using to analyze. So it's AI for AI for AI for AI. It is just oof, round and round. Uh, so this is what you were talking about with Doug and Tim last week about this new uh sneaky yeah reworking yeah i mean what do you guys think about um you know trying to stem the tide or dis determine whether something is ai and is it worth it like as a as an educator or as a you know as a writer um I can totally see the education side. I mean, mm -hmm. just thinking about plagiarism detection software that's been around. I mean, when I wrote my dissertation, I had to go through that. Um, so um, I'm not surprised in, in any way that there's a now a detector, detector, detector. It's just like, you know, that artist painting a picture of an artist painting a picture. It's like, now are we going to get a detector for the detector that detects the detector? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what do you do then? Like, do you, if you're, if you're writing a, a, a paper as a student or as a, if you're a professor, do you even, what do you do with this? If you can't know whether something is written or what do you do if you're a publisher and you can't tell whether something being submitted was written? And it can't be copyrighted either at the moment. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. And I, I think it puts students ultimately, and I, I try to communicate this message. I think it puts students at a disadvantage because they're communicating to people that they're able to do things and, and sure using the technology requires a certain amount of skill, but you know, at what point do you kind of step into the situation where you have promised something on a resume, you've promised something in terms of a, a degree that you've earned or uh, an award that you've won, and then you can't produce at a moment when you have to. Um, and, it, it, you know, it, it's kind of that game of, am I going to actually take the time to develop the skills or am I going to try to bypass the expectations and ultimately i mean at some point you have to not have training wheels on in some profession in some work so i think about it for the future of my students yeah. in that way yeah i guess the uh the uh, uh, uh a response to that could be if they don't use it and they're competing with people that do uh -huh. Are they going to be at a disadvantage? And will employers care if they can or can't without AI? Yeah. Once once they get to medical residency, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wrote a great paper about open heart surgery, but now I'm not so sure. Yeah. Somebody wrote it. Or something right. wrote it. Yeah. Big. Yeah, I. What do you think? So, Bill, go ahead. Well, are, we're at the point right now that the the two things that I can see a publisher holding a publisher back are 
copyright law. Yeah. They can't copyright, which means they can't profit or, uh, off of their expense mm-hmm. and their right because they they can't publish it. It has to be copyrighted in order to put it out there. They publish something that's not copyrighted, then people can just anybody copy else it can sell it themselves right, and it'll right, they, right. no profit. Yeah. The other reason could be because of um, integrity. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, so this is where um, just the question of, you know, b- being asked that question, if I don't do it, if I don't play this game, somebody else will, and I lose out. That That's always been part of the question for integrity. Hey. And so this what I'm finding interesting is that this appears to put it out there as if this is a whole new conundrum. It's not. <laughs> and so publishers right now too, you know, they, they are having this issue of, um, I think what's really holding them back is the copyright law thing. Yeah. Uh, if they can get around that, the integrity part would, uh, so what, yeah. um, God bless all the publishers, but I th- I'm saying at large, you know, in general, it will not be an impediment. So, um, but what is also difficult for them right now is they, they really can't tell what is public, what has been written by human mind and hand, and what has been written by AI. They can't tell the difference anymore. Yeah. And even if they had a tool that would help them, there's a tool to help other people so that they can't be helped with that. Um, yeah, I don't know what I would do as a publisher, to be honest, if I was getting stuff and I, and it's, they, even the copyright thing is, is ill-defined, isn't it? Because like, okay, if something written by AI can't be copyrighted, how about something written by AI that I then rewrite or edit? And then how much editing do I have to do before it can be copyrighted? Or if I start off with something and then I give it to AI and AI rewrites what I wrote, it, where does that stand? Is there a percentage? Is there? Uh, it's like really amorphous. Um, I, I think the same thing with the image generation stuff. You know, if I make an image and then I have AI do something to it and then I get it back and then I do something to what AI did and then, you know, okay, where does that land? I have no idea. on you guys you're supposed to have the answers (laughs) i'm just thinking about that little thing over at the corner that said upgrade now because you know that's kind of the software monetary side of it Mm -hmm. Um, because i mean of course developers are going to be interested in their bottom line and they're going to let the world courts systems decide some of those ethical boundaries uh it's kind of that i can do it so i'm going to do it and while i'm at it i'll profit at it if i can um, so the integrity question is also to some degree for the people that are making it and allowing it to be utilized in different ways yeah there was also on that website for the uh you know uh how to keep hacking it until it doesn't sound uh ai-ish anymore it was something in the lower left hand corner that said you'll get a 30 percent commission yeah uh yeah. so that that profit making thing um ain't nobody want to get in the way of that they're not going to stop that um i think the two that we we've, we've heard a number of times from different creators it was that um what is satisfying to people mm-hmm. right now I find it, it's laughable to me. And that's good old Matt being judgmental. But when I see people like, I wrote this prompt, you know, I look at it, I'm like, is that satisfying creatively? One sentence, you gave it to the magic machine and it made this amazing thing. All I did was send in a prompt and hit a button. Okay, if that's satisfying to you, keep doing it. Do it. Uh-huh. The, I mean, we have to watch this thing play out, which is yeah, it's yeah. Cool. Go ahead. I can picture that following being more uh, in the category of a fad, I guess, 
I'm not saying it will be, but I could see it as, you know, it's super exciting to do all this. And then at some point it becomes saturated and it becomes old hat. It's nobody likes it. You know, nobody's getting excited about it anymore. Um, on the flip side, because it's advancing so fast and changing every single week, it's kind of hard to, it's also harder to get tired of it because it's not the same as it was 10 minutes ago. Um, that doesn't mean it's always going to stay, I guess. I mean, it's, is it going to reach a point at which it can keep advancing and we just don't care anymore because gone as far as we can be amazed at? I don't know. Yeah. And to, to me... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, aesthetically, I mean, there... I can't help but feel this disconnect from something. It's useful for sort of like momentary response. Like, oh, well, that's interesting that someone did that. You know, it's sort of what you're saying there, sort of the wow factor of, hey, look at what we can do. But when I think about something that I respond to in art, it, there's part of me that feels cold and disconnected if someone says, by the way, it was randomly generated. It was just sort of thrown together. And I, yeah. I know um, I saw Mark Wade's post uh, last week or the week before where he was talking about how that argument doesn't fit for everybody. The executive that's looking at one artist versus another artist is going to go with the cheaper bottom line. Um, and I don't know in general, in general how many audience members are like me and they would feel disconnected and go, well, that's... I want to to resonate with a human being when I see something, even if that human being is using very sophisticated tools in some way, I still like that heart to be there in a way. I think there's a stronger connection with that when it's something being done that you can watch as it's being created. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Then that connection to the other human being doing it, like watching a music performance. Um, and then I think there's a little bit more of a disconnect when it's something you're looking at that's already been finished. I totally agree that if you look at something amazing and then somebody says, yeah, that was AI generated immediately, you're like, oh, okay. uh -huh. Uh -huh. I'm not, I'm not as excited about it. Um, the tough thing is that as we've been following all of this, you aren't going to know. Yeah, like somebody can easily say that it is or isn't, and you don't, you know, you can't tell. Um, and I don't know. Has there ever has there ever been any like media or or books or anything where um, you 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 ask the question whether it was by people or not, or you know, or by the same person? Yeah, I mean, there's there's kind of like the Truman Capote debate with. Um, to Kill a Mockingbird, there's the Did Shakespeare Write All of His Plays debate, yeah, mm -hmm. and those works still continue to stand up, and people teach them and use them. Yeah. But there's never been a, did Shakespeare run this through an auto-generation? Yeah. Yeah, because that's, I mean, we're going to be asking that question every time we listen to a song on the radio or music or watch something, and are people going to care I don't know. I'm still reaching for that age of enlightenment. Let's let's celebrate what people can do. When I look at something that someone makes, there is a, a like, wow, look at how that came together, like the finished product. But then I always think to myself, how clever were they to think of that? Or how much time did that take them? And, and this kind of removes that component of, you know, what you would consider those elements of the artistry of chipping away at something literal, literally or figuratively if all you're doing is entering a prompt and it's like, hey, I'd like a golden retriever that um, sings a solo at the Super Bowl. Uh, you know, what? okay, you, you wrote that, I guess. Yeah, I could, we, we um, our, our interview with Tim Timmerman um, kind of comes to mind because his artwork, he, this is, he's a painter who 
puts a lot of uh, allegory and a lot of personal meaning and everything into his artwork, mm-hmm. which is it is at least at the moment AI isn't doing any of that sort of thing. Um, and I'm wondering if maybe that will become more important. Um, and and people will appreciate that kind of thing more. Um, well, either that or AI will gain the ability to mimic being able to do that. I don't know. Uh, but I thought that he, um, AI, well, let's not use, I don't want to use Tim as an example. There, there were some, okay, I will use him as an example. There were some pieces that he did that um, it was able to mimic it. Yes, it looked like if you looked at it, you would say, "Oh, okay, that could be a Tim Timmer." Right. Yeah. Now, play with meaning, uh, and what is what is um, woven into a piece that feels human. Mm-hmm. I don't know how AI is going to do that. Uh, somebody's going to have to tap it with the fairy wand and put some uh, uh, god dust in it in order to really to make it to come to that point. Now, it, it's. It to me, it already is at that point in some ways. The mimicking and the multi-billion uh, uh, computation algorithms are spinning faster and faster and faster. Able to uh, the mimic is because of the speed of the algorithms and the weaving together of thousands and thousands of di- and millions of different ways of doing art. So um, uh, this is why I was going to say uh, the the other um, idea I have is I'm thinking about this guy named J.C. Leyendecker. Yeah, is it? Great illustrator. Yeah. He always amazed me with his capacity to paint in uh, transparent, meaning he, he does these layers of transparencies first, and then he would paint over it with opacity. And he's brilliant with it, just brilliant. And his uh, the reason why he was so believable was because, you know, he did – he studied in Europe and he studied the academy tradition. So he had to draw over and over and over and over and over and over and over the human form. And so it became like shorthand to him. That's what he could do. He also did a lot of research, a lot of, and used photographs and, and models. But then we looked at some things while we were hanging with Tim that had been painted. One was a wave and it had a, a portrait. And there were thicks and thins, meaning transparent and and opacity in that. And I was, I was like, wow, I'm impressed. I want to turn this off and go paint. This is that good. And I, so um, that part of me didn't care that that was rendered by the sweat of a million other artists and scraped by AI. I just felt it was uh, challenging, and I want to go to try to paint like that. It had some inspiration. For yeah, it. yeah. And then I, you know, I was like, oh, "Wait a minute, that's AI." Uh, I'd rather go look at J.C. Leyendecker. Mm-hmm. But who, you know, we've said this. I've said it before. Like, there's millions of people who don't know the difference, and then there's going to be even millions more who don't care. Mm-hmm. So. That's kind of the, I know that that's uh, the wah, wah, look at this. I, there's so many more um, uh, ways this can play out that I can't imagine. Yeah. Um, and and one of the things, Brian, too, and us talking about creativity is that um, how many other things is AI working on right now besides image making? Is it is it just working on making pictures so it can scare people like me? The the breakthroughs just happened to have come for the image and the writing first. Um, that we know about. That we know about. Um, but it's everything else. I mean, yeah. Well, we were we thought, or at least I thought, video is a year behind still. Image baking and now is not. Um, but even yeah, music. Uh, yeah any human endeavor really but what was that also that battery uh element that has been uh they get to step around that now the begins with an i i should have done my research before uh but anyways that was a big deal to, to be able to step an ai was able to help them do that yeah 
yeah um, um it's inventing new it's understanding of proteins now yeah. right we're talking yeah. about this before it could figure out how to next week oh look we're working on cancer we're, we're at this almost figured out so when you add all of those things too ai is going to be a part of this which is what we said before that train left the station a long time ago it's it's very much going to be um really just a discussion of um how much what is satisfying to me it, and then yeah yeah because even like even like when you, you you mentioned you know somebody's gonna have to come along and put magic fairy dust on ai for it to get some of the like some of what like tim puts in his work and stuff and i to be honest at this point and I, who knows this stuff my mind changes on this all the time but I sort of, I, I am at the point where I don't, I, when people say, yeah, but AI will never do this. I, 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 I'm not so sure. Even, even, even like that. I mean, at some point it could simulate an entire human being, the human beings experience growing and learning and everything and then be able to draw upon that to then create stuff and it wouldn't really would you be able to even know that it wasn't you know it would have all the depths and all the spirit or whatever of of, of a human being making something so um yeah i don't know uh yeah i guess then we're just left with what are we going to do and what are we going to what are we going to work on because we want to and what we, what we gain out of it. Um, so Jason, I, I got a question. Um, sure. So the idea was brought up earlier that um, we, we sh we'll just keep doing this because we can. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if, where does that take you with all of the stuff that's on the palette right now with, with what um, AI can do? Where do you see that? What are the possibilities of where that can go when you combine that with, well, we're just going to keep doing it because what the heck? We can't. I mean, I think there, there's been that question of science and, and technology and the evolution uh thinking about Oppenheimer, thinking about, okay, we, we can create this, somebody else can, so we're going to beat them to it. We, we can go to the moon, um, so let's try to do that. You know, it's that, that question of how much is too much, and I don't think that human beings are really good at answering that question in any reasonable way that benefits everyone else. So I, I don't know that it will necessarily meet a stopping point until it conflicts with the wrong interests, uh, until it conflicts with a larger interest that uh, someone in power, that someone that is empowered says, okay, now, now we're going too far. Now we're going too far. Um, th those seem to be the limitations on what we do with technology and with science, when, when you sort of offend the wrong person or when you break some moray or some code, then that's the point at which the Supreme Court gets involved or uh, a larger discussion happens. But in terms of, of daily use, uh, you know, I, I think it continues until it continues. And as long as people profit from it and as long as it creates sort of a, an interesting wow factor and the problems don't necessarily affect uh, anyone with kind of their hand on the the stop button, then I think that it continues. It, yeah, I uh, I was I was reading a, an article uh, just about how different China is approaching all of this than we are. Um, and how focused they are on using it for population control. Um, so, yeah, I don't know where their stop button is uh, or what they're investing in that we don't know about or, yeah, really anybody. Um, yeah. We were talking about the, the fairy dust. One of the moments that, I, that I've enjoyed most 
as I've grown and worked in, in literacy and talking with authors, talking with artists, you know, that moment when you've read something and you talk with someone and they point out some aspect, like um, Raul the Third, the person that does Stunt Boy in the meantime, and lots of children's graphic novels and picture books. There's a necklace in his Lowrider series that's based on his grandmother. And there's, I, I resonate with that human element. If you told me, well, the necklace was part of an ingredient that we put in there. Um, you know, you, you were talking about AI sort of being born and uh, emerging and going through a human experience, which uh, I don't I don't think that's off the table either. Uh, maybe I'm just too much of an Asimov fan, but I, I think the idea of a, a, an AI system being given time to sort of mature in that way, you know, uh, in, in sort of a technological wine metaphor, I think that could happen. But then how do you, how do you with integrity decide what experiences it gets to have? You know, do we let it experience childhood trauma? Do we let it experience, uh, therapy or the betrayal of therapy or um you know what are those what are those elements that we weave in and then ultimately i can't really write it a fan letter because it's just going to generate a response to me from multiple other creators writing back to their fans instead so that that exchange you know when i, when I was growing up and i would write a letter to um a comics company and they would print my letter or, or you know you get the letter back i got a letter back from ray bradbury one time in his handwriting and it was this huge moment of connection even though i never got to meet him um so there is there is a part of me that thinks for some people at least there's that point of connection that exists between an audience and a creator but uh, Matt, to your point, I think you're right. I think that there are people that don't necessarily care about that. Uh, and there are certainly people that might not take the time to investigate and know the difference. Will there be an ethical consideration, you know, sort of like a Comics Code Authority or uh, an MPAA rating that says AI generated, mm. created with um, free range materials or... Is that a question that comes up at any point, especially when we're thinking about copyright? Are we legally required to disclose how much AI is in a product? Right, and do you have to give the percentage? Right. Well, with the with the document, you did. There was a certain level that I had to meet in order for my dissertation to pass. I think it was like thirty three percent or something like that, because everyone uses the A and N, and everyone uses quotes from particular sources. But, right. Uh, you know the the sort of that factory model of uh, to what percentage is it that uh, something has to meet? At least fifty per fifty one percent human. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, the, in in that regard, then um, the issue of uh, will we have that consideration for the um, the AI in the incubator? Um, from from what I know about it, it's in the incubator now, and so it's already being fed everything all the time. Yeah. I think the difference, though, would be if he, if it was simulating from the beginning a whole human being life experience instead of just being told and observing all of the ones that we've had, it's going to experience it itself. Here's the interesting thing, though. Um, so, like, when they're training AI to play soccer, for instance, uh, they can train AI the equivalent of a human being playing soccer for 10 years. But in AI time, it can do that in a few days. But it's experienced 10 years worth of a human being playing soccer. So you could have it simulate a human life, and it doesn't have to wait, you know, 60 years. It will it could happen, you know, in a few days or whatever, whatever the current computational speed is. But, yeah, then do you 
I guess it's what do you attribute to the AI? Do you attribute empathy towards it? If it, can it suffer? I, I mean, it gets weird. Uh -huh. It's really Is there weird. ethical treatment of AI. Do we give it the worst experiences possible? Right. So that and it can, then and, so then it can draw upon that those experiences to create stuff that we find more believable. Is that ethical? The other thing, too, is that if it is consuming everything right now in this incubation period, yes, not in an intentional one, it's, it just seems to be being done, Yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, if, it's, if it is doing that, and, and I heard you, Jason, say, and I, and I write it a fan letter, it's just going to compile all that it's learned from the, I don't know, 127,000 other fan letters that decided to consider. But it's mm -hmm. also because it has everything that's on the internet, it can look at my personal medical files and and craft that fan res letter response in a way that is specific to me yeah. in a scary way. <laughs> uh, well, it has access to all of your emails and all of your Zoom chats and all of your things you've ever clicked the like button on and all of your YouTube viewing history. And it could craft a letter that you'll probably really like. So, yeah. I mean, these are just, again, that's the scary side. And what I always, you know, what, what we've been saying for the past, how many, it's been four months now, it seems like years, that we've started having these conversations. Um, it could fix climate change next week. If you have 10,000 AI bots working on an issue and they're doing billions of computations every two minutes, okay, that could happen. But, Brian, can you let me share the screen? Yes. Bring it back to the visual. Um, so I saw this on Facebook, and this is a person who I had... They had earlier. Can you see that? Yep. Uh -huh. So uh, this is a person who two days earlier they had put up something that was so very obviously AI, and they were and in, they were interested in it. It was a lovely image to them, mm -hmm. uh, but the hands were made out of the same material that the was the clothing. And I said that well, there's, <laughs> but also it had all of the stuff that's AI that is it was just too damn perfect. Mm -hmm. Is this AI? The what would lead me to think that it might be is just because of the tread sizes on the smaller parts. Not that you couldn't find long treads that would fit. So I don't know. Okay. And I'm I defer gonna... to your visual expertise because yeah, yeah. that's the, the only area. thing about it that would make me think I don't know. So this is the Buddha. It was put up there as a, you know, an image. Oh, I said, this is so cool. It's made out of tire treads. To right. me, too, it's uh, just visually, it's the hands. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Because the hand, the, the tread size on the hand, like the yeah. hands look like they're made out of the same treads as the rest right. of it, but the pa the texture on it is different. They're sculpt. They're almost like sculpted hands. And right. I've never worked in tire treads as a medium before, but wow, yeah. somebody with real skill yeah. sculpted those hands. Okay, so I'll stop sharing now. Uh, it's my little experiment there. That's messing with meaning. When I have to stop and say, wait a minute, what is that? Who made that? And it's the who made that that's important because then it also leads to why did they make that? Um, and why didn't they just do it themselves? Why did they have AI make it to make it look, you know, it, it's, I started to go down that. So to me, again, that, that brings it all back to um, authenticity and um in particular, and this is something you I've heard you say a number of times, Brian, um, what do we believe online? Is it is uh, do we can we still believe anything online? We've seen what Sora can do. We can make a little choo choo train go along on, on a leaf. And mm -hmm. certainly can make my my favorite political hero do something bad. Most people wouldn't know that that was not a real dog on the keyboard. Right. Yeah. So 
we that is another aspect of all of this visual stuff that you know it's interesting i mean uh -huh. this is what we're seeing how much are we not seeing that ai is doing in all sorts of different fields right but this stuff yeah it messes with meaning to me yeah and what happens like when all the media you see you can't you don't you can't the connection that we have with like you were saying before Jason too with like a human another human being making something there is something to that connection and then if we can no longer believe that we that there might or might not be a actual any connection there you know what is that going to do um yeah I, yeah, you know, and it also got me thinking, like, like, like I have heroes. I have musical heroes. I have artistic heroes um, of mine. Uh, writing heroes. Uh, what are those going to go away? Because we don't. You won't know. Well, it's definitely that that criticality. Yeah, I mean, I've been teaching students this for years of evaluating resources, looking at multiple resources, asking questions, talking to people. Um, criticality doesn't go away. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard for me to envision having a, like, that, like, um, what am I trying to say? So, like, Charles Schultz, I love early Peanuts stuff, one of my heroes. It's, it's him and and especially the the earlier peanut stuff I absolutely love. I can't see ever making a connection to something that's been generated like I have to the peanut stuff because I know it's made by Charles Schultz, who is a person. Uh, but I don't know, you know, how much if that's something a lot of people would even care about losing that connection. I don't know. Well, you heard that Beatles song that came out uh, recently, and it was uh, just a song that they'd found that Lennon had uh, done with a tape recorder, I guess, in the next room or something. And it little, you know, little uh, line on the under under the video. Yeah, this was AI created, mm -hmm. blending in the Beatles' voice to the rest of the Beatles. Nobody seemed to care about that. I haven't heard it yet for that reason. To be honest, yeah, I mean, I I haven't listened to it. I I saw the the article and I saw that the, you know it's there and I purposefully I'm not interested. I'm just not interested. Same. But Billy Joel's new song, I'm all about that one. Okay. <laughs> it is not AI that I know of. Okay, well then then we're good. <laughs> but if you find out that it is, <laughs> what what are you gonna think? There again, that human connection. I'm, I'm thinking about when I hear that song. I actually used it along with a novel that I was reading in a class, just to talk about this human experience. Uh, I I would not enjoy personally. I would not enjoy that as much. Worried to find that out. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking about the like the song, uh, the Nine Inch Nails song, Hurt. And then it was re-recorded -re by Johnny Cash. And so it had a certain meaning and a feel to it when Nine Inch Nails did it. And it's about addiction and some different things. And if you know the history of the guy in Nine Inch Nails, and then you have, you know, that brings certain feelings. But then when Johnny Cash sings it, and he brings what you know of Johnny Cash to it, it changed it immensely. And it added a whole nother layer of, you know, like, emotion and connection to it. Um, but what if somebody had AI sing that in Johnny Cash's voice? Right. And Johnny Cash hadn't done it, you know? Right. Which is where we're at with that. Right, right. And now with Sora, I just saw, it. it's interesting you mentioned Charles M. Schultz. I mean, he was my my guy too. Um, and I just saw this video of him drawing, uh, you know, it was done in like 1971 or something like this. And it's beautiful to see him lay down that ink. Mm-hmm. <laughs> think without any underlying pencil strokes it's just amazing how he could draw that guy's head so round without any uh aids um but he did what if i found out later on that was all fabricated by sora does that lessen my appreciation for charles m schultz does it upset my feeling of groundedness i would think it would in the world 
Yeah, I think it would. would what's what's real? It would change your relationship to it. Yeah. And returning to that question of authorship, if if you had an author that you loved and you read their book and it inspired you, and then you found out that someone else wrote it and they just peddled it as their own, I wouldn't feel the same way about that person. I would now think of them as a thief, right? And I would feel manipulated in my emotions about it. Mm-hmm. And I would feel sorry for the person that they were pulling material from and not giving proper credit to. Yeah. But that is also everything that can be said about AI. What you just said, substitute mm -hmm. that author for AI. Mm -hmm. Lots of ethical boundaries. Mm -hmm. And if you're a discerning consumer, uh, I think earlier in the conversation, one of you mentioned that idea of like what's satisfying to you as an artist, but also what's satisfying to the consumer. It's an interesting roller coaster ride we're on right now. Yeah. And we made it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because we could. And so because we could. there. This is this is a whole other discussion that this is sort of brought up, but just yeah, the whole devaluing effect that this could have on the intake of creative endeavors. You know, I mean, if if you can no longer trust everything, then are you ever going to be able to have the same connection that you that you know that we've always had with people who write and make art and music and all of that? Um. Seems like that would be a big loss. Absolutely. Yeah. As somebody that values the artistic community, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. On the other hand, maybe it will strengthen people's appreciation of things that they know for sure are made by people. I don't know. Of course, no one will be able to make money doing it, but <laughs> and that's a pretty risky experiment too, right? Uh, without any intention of, um, how can this be a thing that is beneficial? Mm -hmm. By tossing the cards up in the air and hoping they all come down in a nice way. Mm -hmm. uh, they might, they might, Matt. Yeah, they might all no. come down, and it, yep, it could be a, you know, royal flush there. Yeah, that'd be nice. Sure. Yep. The odds of the lottery. <laughs> well, we're at the top of the hour. We are. We are. We went longer than we were even thinking of doing, but very good discussion. And I feel we could go on. There are other I've... what ifs here. There are other ethical oh, questions. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 This is some stuff we Do have. Do you have another on. one in mind, Jason? I'm you sorry. An ethical question in mind right now? Well, uh, we were just talking about authenticity, and I was thinking about the um, comics grading that happens and you know how you, you pay a certain amount of money to have someone take a photo with something that they've signed or things like that. So uh, th there could be all sorts of interesting places that people go in search of the experience of, of an original composition is what I was thinking about. And I think your example of Charles Schultz made me think about that. That's okay. You want to come back and talk about that another time? Oh, well, sure. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. I would be glad to. That's a good, good one. one. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. All right. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Brian. Great stuff. Yeah. Thank Very you both. Thank you for having me. Yep. Okay. Yeah.